Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Bobcat Can Live Trainer Live event. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be taking a look at the V9 lathe module. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, we're going to get started here in a couple of minutes, give everybody a chance to uh, pop in. Looks like we're getting a few people coming in right now. So uh, we're going to get started in about five, ten minutes, and then we'll get underway. All right. So again, today uh, we're going to be doing the V9 lathe module. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, bear with me one second here. Hold on. All right, so uh, if any of you guys have any questions, you do have a little questions box within your GoToMeeting panel. Uh, feel free to type up any questions. We're going to try to leave all questions uh, for about 30 minutes before noon and uh, about 30 minutes before 3, just to cover those. So if you guys do have any questions as we're going through, we'll try to make them about what we're talking about just so we can stay on track a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to first start out with uh, showing you guys where you can download your post processors, uh, you know, little things like that, things to kind of get you started. So I already have the Bobcad support website pulled up. You're going to want to create a free account. Uh, it does not matter if you have uh, the Advantage plan or any, any of the support packages or not, you can sign up for a free account. But if you do have an Advantage plan or a support plan, let us know. We can update your permissions on this site so you can get access to everything you should. So I'm just going to log in. And now over on the left-hand side, not only are you going to see the virtual training videos, that's where all of these videos go. So after we're done today, uh, you can see we actually have quite a bit already preloaded on here. Uh, now, again, if you're Advantage members, you can get the Tier 2, but you may not see those right away. So let us know if you are an Advantage member that gets that. Uh, we can update your permissions. But what we want to go down to right now is your post processors. It's going to be under the documents and manuals. You also have your software updates in here. So you have a download or request. So typically you want to start with the download post processor. Uh, you're going to want to enter your customer ID. I'm just going to enter some random numbers there. <laughs> now you're going to want to go to your SOLIDWORKS V7 through V9. Uh, so if you have uh, V6 or V5, uh, those may or may not work for them. You set your machine type, and today we're looking at lathe. You'll have your controller make. Let's just go Fnook. And then you'll have your different models that we have. Now, if a post processor is on our website, that means that it has worked for someone. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for you. So let us know if you download one and you need any modifications to it. We'll try to help you out the best we can. Now, if you don't see a post on that list, you're going to want to do a post request. When you do a post request, we're going to uh, send you a request form. Um, you, know, you have your download request form here. If you contact support, they can send you all this information as well. You're going to want to enter all your uh, info, machine manufacturer, controller make model, machine make model, you know, stuff like that, serial number if you got it, uh, dealer contact information, so if you need to get a hold of them, you can. And then you have your different downloads for the different request forms. So if you're doing a standard lathe post, you just want to download that lathe post request form. It is really important you provide us with a sample program, preferably something that's actually run on the controller and actually works in the machine. Uh, a list of all your CAN cycles, especially for turning. And any uh, GNM codes that you have the definitions and everything for. So those are the three main things that you really need to have to submit a post request. So let's just go ahead and get to the software here. Now the first thing we need to do when we have SolidWorks open is to make sure our add-in is on. Now I'm just going to go ahead and open up one of these turning parts that we're going to start with. Let's just open this guy here real quick. And it appears my add-in may be on already. It is. So I don't need to enable it. But if you do need to enable it, you're going to want to go to your add-ins. So it's under your tools. And you just want to make sure that the Bobcam for SolidWorks is enabled. Now, you don't have to have it on the startup, but you do want to have it at least enabled. Uh, 
if you're noticing that it's taking a while to launch SolidWorks, you can always disable that and just turn it on when you need it. But this is going to be where you're going to enable or disable that Bobcam plugin. If I turn it off right there, it should get rid of all this here shortly. So you want to make sure if you don't see those three tabs at the end on your feature tree, go into the add-ins and turn on your Bobcam for SolidWorks. Now this should be V9. It is. All right. And my tree loaded back in. Now the big important thing with turning, before you even set up a job, and all the parts that I currently have uh, that we're going to be taking a look at today actually already have it set in the correct orientation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your parts are going to be in the right orientation. So if we look down here at the gnomon, I am oriented where this is in the XZ. So if I'm looking at it sideways, I'm in the XZ plane. So I really don't need to do a lot to set this up. So I can go right to cam defaults and go to new job. We're going to be doing turning. I'm going to set it to the BC2X lathe. You really don't need to set it to any of these machines. Uh, obviously, we do have some loaded in here of certified posts that are already installed. And then you do have your uh, parameter templates. So if you have gone in and started to save out separate templates, uh, settings for different, uh, say, material types or you know what have you, you want to make sure you select and load that template. So we're going to keep the start stock wizard on, and I'm just going to click the green check mark. We'll select our workpiece, and then hit next. Now I need to set a stock coordinate system. Now this is already defaulting to the X, Z plane. So that's, it's already normal to this. I don't really need to do anything. If you don't have it in this orientation, you're going to have to have a coordinate system uh, to actually set everything to. We'll take a look at that a little bit later today because I know a lot of SOLIDWORKS users are not familiar with setting that reference geometry. So I already have my stock coordinate system set. I just need to set my diameter. And I want to say this is, well, let's go two and a half. And that should be solid. Yep, so I don't need to add anything for the ID, but we'll add a little stock origin to it. So let's increase the length. And I'm just scrolling on my wheel to extend those out. And maybe we'll uh, set our stock origin at maybe 30 thou, just to take a little bit off the face. So I'll hit next. Now, same thing with the machine setup. You do need to set the machine setup here, so we're going to need to select our coordinate system, which I didn't actually make one. Ah, so good. We'll have to do one right away. So let me just go ahead and hit OK. Now, technically, it is in the right orientation. I don't actually need to make a, uh, a reference geometry for this, but we're going to go ahead and make one just so that you guys can see how to do so and to make it more of a habit than anything else, because if you don't set this uh, reference geometry properly, you may not be able to orient anything to your part. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to Insert, Reference Geometry. We're going to go to Coordinate System. Now the selections, it's already kind of there. I don't really need to change anything. But uh, you may have to set the plane that you're going off of, you know, set a sketch to, to go off of. So you may actually have to do a couple of additional things to get this. Like I said, later on today, we're going to have an uh, orientation where this is not normal to the XZ plane. So I'm just going to hit the green check. By having that coordinate system in your feature tree, that gives you something that you can select to set your stock or your machine setup to. So for instance, if I go back to my machine setup and edit, now I can select that machine setup. So I want to click coordinate system 1, and that's going to set those axes for me. Now, again, if you draw your part in this orientation, you're not going to really need to worry about that reference geometry at all. If you're bringing in stuff from, say, an assembly that where it might be way out in space, or you're drawing parts in a top view instead of, or a side view instead of the top, you may run into difficulty. And again, like I said, we're going to work, look at that a little later this afternoon. So now I have my job all set, my machine setup's good to go. 
I'm just going to right click machine setup one and I'm going to go to lathe end face. Now with the turning module, you can either select a solid or you can go in and select a sketch. Now I don't really have a flat sketch here, but I believe if I just hit that edge, it has been quite a while since I've kind of played around with this. If I click just that face, that it's setting the vector that I'm setting my facing to. I can't change my feature type. Uh, my rapid plane is 200 thousandths from the selection. And then I have my constraints. So I'm going to go from stock. Now, this is a part that always kind of trips people up. If you don't add the stock material to the face of the part, you want to go to custom and then enter the value that you're going to be facing off. Otherwise, it's not going to give you toolpath at all. If you've added the material to the stock definition, you can leave it from stock and it'll machine just fine. I also usually turn on extensions. So extensions, I don't really need a start extension. You know, it's going from region one, so it's coming from the OD to the ID. But I do want to extend the end the end of that toolpath so it passes the center just a little bit and then comes off. So I'm going to say it goes past, let's do 25 thou. And I'm really just compensating for the radius of my tool just so that I can get a nice smooth face. Now the next page I have my default strategies. You have a rough or a rough and finish. With facing, I really could just make this a rough and get rid of my Z allowance. You have your separate moves or can cycles. Let's just say can cycles. If you're doing a finish by itself, you cannot get a can cycle, especially on facing. The facing can cycles, the way they work is it references the previous cycle. So if you're not doing a rough, you're not going to get a can cycle out of your finish. Just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, it's kind of a basic way that works. And then we got to our tool. Now the tooling does dynamically draw based on what you enter. So if I change my nose radius, say instead of 15 thou, it's 32, you're going to see a difference in this little image. Let's just keep it on the 15. You're going to have your reference point. So this is how we're referencing that G-code. Now corner is pretty typical. So if you're touching off the flat sides of your insert, that's going to create the tangency uh, point that we're generating here. You also have tip, where you can touch just the tip of the radius, or you have center of radius. So you have a couple of different ways to comp that toolpath based on the way you're touching off your tools. Then you have your different shapes of tools. Now these work just like any, um, anytime you go to order tooling, you know, if you're getting a VNMG, a WNMG, and you're entering those variables here. Now the only ones that really matter are going to be the shape, and I believe the clearance does factor in a little bit, but the tolerance and type really doesn't make any difference. So I'm going to keep it on the 80 degree diamond. Actually, let's make that 55. So I'm going to change this to a DNMG. The tool label does not automatically update, so keep that in mind as you're going through you may want to change your tool label because your post-processor may have the tool label output in your G-code. Uh, then you have your insert orientation. Now I'm going to turn on the tool folder up in the upper right so we can see how that tool sits. So you can have that tool orientation vertical or horizontal. And then your insert orientation, let's turn this off, is actually where the, it kind of controls the direction of that tool. Like that's the there's a couple of factors that go along into this. So insert orientation by itself is just the orientation of that insert. But it's more typical if you're doing insert orientation two, you'd be doing an OD cut from the chuck to the face of the part. If you're on orientation three, you'd typically do, be doing an ID from the chuck to the face. And orientation four would be like an ID or a fr uh, front face from the ID to OD or face to Chuck. So these are kind of setting how it's using that insert. If I take a moment just to go back real quick, I'm going to go to the feature page. 
this region does factor into the insert orientation that we automatically set. So if you set it to region two, you're going to go from ID to OD, and I go back to the tooling, it's already setting that insert orientation for me. Uh, so don't worry about it too much. We're actually going to set it for you based on some of the selection you do ahead of time. The only reason you really need to change it is if you need to um, you know, kind of use that tool in a different way. Then we have our machining data. Now, one thing I will definitely recommend for everybody is don't worry about the tool numbers. If you worry too much about the tool numbers right now, it, you're just going to have a miserable time as you go through to, to try to manage those numbers. Uh, it can be not that you're going to always have a miserable time. That's, that's not really the case. More or less, it, it, numbers can change on you because the way Bobcat automatically generates tooling. So don't be surprised if you do start going through and setting all your tool numbers if something changes on you and all your tool numbers change. It can happen. So I usually try to just err on the side of caution and just worry about them at the end. You can always label tool, two different tools the same number. You know, it happens a lot where somebody might define a tool in the rough category and the finished category, but they're the same tool. Yeah, they're in the same, uh, same spot on that turret. So worry about the tool numbers at the end. It's good to know and be aware of them so you can kind of catch if they're changing on you, but don't focus too heavily on them in the beginning. Then you have your spindle direction. Oh, and you do also have an override offset. So if you need to change, you know, that maybe this tool uses offset number five, you can set that here by coming in here and just typing it in. And then lastly here, you have your spindle direction, clockwise, counterclockwise, your coolant, and your RPM or constant surface speed. So you have a couple different ways to calculate these out. It does not automatically calculate speeds and feeds for turning, so you're going to want to know what your tooling is, uh, tooling recommendations are for. Now on this patterns page, because I'm doing a can cycle, I really don't have a lot of options available to me. I have standard. That's pretty much it. Uh, then you have your system compensation on or off. If you use on, you can do with collision detection. So we're going to compensate for the radius of the tool. And we're also going to compensate for the insert shape. You can also apply the tool holder to that. Or you can do on without collision detection. Now, typically for facing, I would do an on without collision detection because I don't need to compensate for uh, potential crashes. So we'll go ahead and hit next. Oh, and you do have G41 and G42 if you need. Then we have our depth of cut. Now in a Z move, this is just a straight depth, so it's going to be 50 thou per pass. Let's just make that uh, 30. And I'm going to get rid of the finish allowance on both X and Z. That way it doesn't leave any of that material. You do also have a rough allowance, so if I wanted to kind of create a pre-finish pass, kind of ease into the cut, I can turn this on and maybe say I want to leave 5 thou on Z, 0 on X, and it's going to add an additional kind of finish pass just to get down to that, that 5 thou. Now the overlap, depending on the way your can cycles work, may or may not do anything right now. Uh, this is something that... Uh, Usually, you can only control without having can cycles on. Now, two previous cut is going to continue the path to the previous operation before retracting. No overlap will give you kind of what a can cycle would, very stair-stepped kind of piece. And then custom distance, you can have it extend whatever value you want past the end of the path. And it does just follow the geometry. So I usually just leave it on previous cut. If I'm doing can cycles, it's more likely not going to use this anyways. Now, there's a couple options we can't use right now. Uh, we're going to take a look at those a little bit later. For now, we'll just stick to the ones we can use with the can cycles. So you have a round option or a sharp option for corners. Round is pretty typical because your tool is round. But a lot of people wanted to have a sharp move, just a straight line move, and then a turn. So we threw that in there a few years ago. Next page, we have our rapids. Now, the rapids are going to be a big deal for pretty much everybody. Um, how you approach a part is not as critical, but how you exit can really change your whole program. So 
the approach, you have a default rapid on approach, which is just going to analyze whether you're doing a front face operation, an OD, an ID, and it's going to apply the clearances that have already been defined on the machine setup. So I typically stick to rapid, the default rapid on the approach. The exit, on the other hand, you have a lot of options here. If I use the default rapid on exit, I can tell it I'm not going to move my, I might move my X to, say, two inches. Now, this is a radial value, so in the code, it's going to do four inch diameter. And Z to, I don't know, maybe I only want to bring that one inch off the part. Maybe I'm going to use that tool one, one more time on the next op. Well, and that's where some of the other options come in. So this is just a position you can tell it to go to, and it's going to figure out which one it needs to move first. But if I click on this drop-down menu, you have Rapid on Exit's Tool Home, which is the same thing. You're just giving it a Tool Home position. The cool thing about this one, though, is you can tell it and specify, I want to do X and then Z, Z and then X, or X and Z at the same time. The next one you have is Exit to Cycle Start. So this will actually exit the part and go back to the initial position for the beginning of this path, which is really handy when you're going into like an OD rough right afterwards with the same tool. So I'm actually going to use it, uh, the return to cycle start, but I'm going to do the ZX because I'm doing facing. So I'm going to come straight off and then back up. The other options in here are pretty much the same thing as the rest. You have your define point and how it moves there, and then there's a no wrap it. So really the only one that's different is this return to cycle start. I use that pretty, uh, pretty regularly. Yes, so Tom just asked, can you, select, uh, can you set the default rapid distance? I have a small lathe and I need less than five on average. Uh, we will touch on that in just a second. As soon as we calculate this tool path, I will go into that because you can do that on the tool level itself. Um, and we may actually just kind of go back uh, a couple of steps just to define some tools and such so you guys can see all that. Uh, the next page we have our lead in and lead out. This will also kind of automatically figure out what you're doing based on your feature type, your insert orientation, and then it will apply the, the correct lead in and lead out for you. Every now and then, like say on a lead out, I might tell it I want to do horizontal just to make sure that it's coming off straight off the face. Uh, you know, so angle, vertical, horizontal, perpendicular, and parallel. So you typically parallel in on a face and then horizontal out or perpendicular out. Either which one would be pretty much the same thing. I am going to shorten the length though. Let's make that 50 thou. And then the last page we have our advanced feed rates. Uh, really there's a lot of, not a lot of options here. Uh, you have a lead in and lead out feed rate percentage. So if you wanted to slow it down as it enters and speed it up as it exits, you can do that right here. You can even convert rapids to a feed. So if you wanted to specify a specific feed rate that the rapids moved, you can. And there's no more next, so I want to hit compute. Now we're going to take a second and we're going to take a look at the tooling a little bit to kind of touch on Tom's question because that's really probably where I should have started. But we're going to go to the tool library. Now, in the tool library, you're going to have your drills and your turning tools. So let's take a look at the turning tools first. Now that, well, you know what? Let's do the drills first. Really not anything special here. You're going to have your uh, center drill, drill, your taps, which you don't have to worry about defining those. The operation itself defines those. Uh, you have your chamfer tools, counterbore, reaming, and boring. Really, these are all kind of the same. Uh, and if I click on any one of these tools, like the eighth inch drill, and I expand my tool parameters over on the upper right, I can see all the details of this tool. So if I had a 135 point angle, I could put that in here. Uh, I could specify a tool number or tool material if I needed to, if I'm using automatic speeds and feeds, which you can't on this one. You can define a holder. Uh, but you can also set custom speeds and feeds. And under the assign tool geometry, which one was it? Was it the assign holder? Nope. Did they move it on the... Oh, 
Okay, so the drills don't have it, but let's double check something here. Okay, yeah, so the drills don't have your uh, default rapid position. So that's something that you're going to have to set, because when you do a drill, and you'll see that in a little while, we're going to add a drill to this, that you're, you can still set the rapids. So on a drill, you're going to have to specify where it's going to rapid to. Um, but for a, there's a couple of places that you can set defaults. When you're defining your tool itself, you can specify a home position for them. So kind of going to Tom's question, he has less than five on average. He can specify in here specifically for each individual tool. So if you have a 12 tool changer, uh, you know, turret on your, on your lathe, you can set up each tool to a specific position to fit the length of that tool, you know, how it sits in the, the uh, turret and everything. On top of that, you know, besides the regular definition, you can make custom shapes, custom folders. We're going to look at that maybe a little later this afternoon. But on the machine level itself, the current settings, there should be a Am I just imagining things? I might be just imagining things. Okay, so the only setting you can really change in the machine, the current settings, like the default, would be whether you're doing theoretical point or cutting arc center. Um, I could have sworn there was like a home position in here, but that might actually be on the mill turn definitions. So the tooling is the only place you're going to be able to specify a default position there, Tom. Um, the drills, you're going to have to set those every time, uh, but the actual turning tools, you can set default positions for those rapids, those retracts. Now let's go ahead and look at the tool crib real fast. Uh, and actually, let me see, what diameter is that? All right, so that's like a tap tool. So if I go to turning tools again, we're going to go to tool crib. So let's say you do have a, a turret with, you know, 12 stations on it or so. The tool crib is where you're actually defining what tools you have on that machine. So this is really where you want to go to define all, the, all your tools how your turret is set up. So if I go in and add from tool library, let's just grab a center drill. Now I'm looking at just the center drill category where I can say I have, uh, let's go with the number seven. Now you can set up the tool parameters if you need be. Again, you can't set a default retract position uh, like you can on the turning tools, but So there's my center drill, now it's tool number two. If you go ahead and set up your turret here first, you're not going to have as many problems with tool numbering. So keep that in mind as you're going through. If you don't change your tools very often on your turret, or if you have a tool post, you're pretty much changing them every time. Um, but if you have a turret and you're not changing them very often, you can go in here and set these all up, save this, save this out, and then reload it anytime you come in. You can actually even save the defaults for the turning job. So you always have them when you load it. Now I'm going to just add maybe a couple more tools. Let's say we grab a, a grooving tool. Do I need a grooving tool for this one? Yeah, I do. And let's say it's a 1 8 wide OD groover. So grooving tools are a little different, and even some of the tool folders are going to be a little unique. So I've expanded my tool parameters. I'm going to leave the label alone, tool number, offset registry, all that stuff I'm going to leave alone. Um, I'm going to come down to the edit tool folder, though. So each different type of turning tool is going to have their own unique folder definitions that you can find. So uh, if you can't find what you're actually using, you may have to draw it up. Again, we'll try to take a look at that a little bit this afternoon. But if I take this default shape, this A value is representing this section right here from the tip of the tool to the shoulder. 
So if I change that number, we should actually see it change on this part down here. It's just like the turning tools, they draw dynamically. Now, if you're using this for a cutoff tool as well, and this is the reason why I kind of stopped and did a grooving tool. When you're doing grooving, um, this insert holder is typically like 90 degrees. It's perpendicular to this at, you know, as in your machine. So this back relief is not going to have any chance of colliding. In our simulation, that's going to take out a lot of stuff if you're having really deep cutoffs and stuff like that. So what I do normally, if I'm going in and defining a tool that's going to be kind of a universal groover cutoff for large parts, small parts, because I'm using the same type of insert, what I'll do is I'll actually just make this A value the same length as the shank. So if I make that 6, now I have this little triangle out here. But if I take C and B and set them to 0, it gets rid of it. Then you get the shank width. Now, you can't really see anything there because it's reduced down to the width of A. So I'm actually going to just take the shank width and make it 100 thou. Notice how it moves that tool over. I did 100 thou because that's just slightly smaller than the eighth inch width of that cutoff. Lastly, you have your hand, whether it's a left hand or right hand tool. Uh, this really doesn't matter nearly as much as just making sure you have the right spindle direction, because that's just going to affect simulation more than anything. But when you define your tool, you can set what type of hand you're using. So I've got my groove tool there. I'll go ahead and hit OK. And now that's been added to my tool crib. So now I have three tools in this crib. We're just going to stop with those for now and hit OK. And let's go ahead and we'll start with a drill first. We'll maybe make this a tapped hole. Um, and I should have gotten my 3D mouse out, but I didn't. Not a big fan of maneuvering around SolidWorks. All right, so let's do a lathe tap hole. So you should be able to select the face um, of that hole, but it's going to get your depth and should get your diameter. Uh, I believe that is a quarter 20. So we're just going to, actually, let's make that a quarter 28 just to change it up. So when you're doing a tap, you need to set your thread type and then your thread size. That sets everything. And then we'll, when we're done setting up this tap, we'll go back and look at the tapping library so you guys can see how those are all defined. So in this feature page, you're going to have your rapid and feed plane, uh, the diameter, which kind of is irrelevant for this because the drill and everything, the tap, gets defined by the thread type. So you don't really need to worry about that too much. Uh, then you have your top of feature, which is the face of the part. And then our total depth is defined by the feature that I selected, that, that cutout. Okay, so this is going to be a right hand, and it's a blind hole. So I did this as a quarter 28. Let's just do it as a rolling tap. So that gives me center drill, drill, rolling tap. I've already modified my templates to not include chamfer, which we'll take a look at here shortly. I want to do can cycles. Typically, that's what you're going to want to use. Now, if you notice, it's automatically pulled that number seven center drill. We normally would pull a number five, but because I went in and defined my tool crib, it pulls from the tool crib first. So if you set up all your tools ahead of time, you really can't mess it up too bad. It's, a, it's harder to select wrong tools or have tools that you're selecting outside of your, uh, your turret. However, it can happen. It can automatically generate a tool because you don't have one on your turret, for instance. You know, if you don't plan on doing a quarter 28 and you have a tool in there for a quarter 20 tap, that could change things. Uh, then you have your parameters for the center drill. Now, let's go ahead and add a little chamfer to this. Now, this is one of my favorite little parts. Uh, so. 
Tom is asking what the system tool means. So system tool means that it's going to grab from our library. Uh, typically, when this is checked on, you're still going to be able to set the diameter. You know, if you're on mill, it'll be the diameter and corner radius. Uh, on turning, you're not going to really change that much, except for like turning tools where we're setting the uh, nose radius and everything. This is more for mill, but essentially we automatically draw tools if the system doesn't have one. So when you type in a diameter, say for like a, an end mill, we'll automatically generate a label and set the flute length to be adequate for what you're doing, the, the total length of the tool. We're kind of doing a lot in the process when system tool is on. If you turn system tool off, you're opening up all of the parameters for you to modify yourself. So if you don't modify something correctly, it, that's going to have an effect, adverse effect on the tool path, possibly. So typically you don't need to mess with the system tool. That's only if you need to go in and change these values. Now one of the things that I really like about center drill is that you can actually set either a depth for the center drill or you can even do a center diameter. So if I wanted to get maybe like a 25 thou chamfer on this, I can say 275 is the diameter I'm trying to get. And based on the center angle, it figures out the depth that it needs to do to get that uh, 275 diameter of that chamfer. Then you have your cycle type. You can actually peck now. This was added, I believe, in V9. Uh, it might have been V8. So you have your peck and fast peck. Uh, then we have our rapids again. So as I said earlier on the turning tools, and I, I could have sworn they were on the drills when you're in lathe, but I guess they're not. When you're setting up a lathe drill, tap, drill, doesn't matter, you're going to have to make sure you enter in that home position or tell it to rapid to cycle start, which would probably not be very typical. So in Tom's case, where he doesn't have a lot of room, you're going to have to change your your Z home position quite regularly um, so that it doesn't uh, reach those limits. On the regular tooling, the regular inserts and such, you can define that on the tool itself, but on the drilling, you can't. And it's only like that because it's shared between mill and lathe. So you know, mill doesn't have a home position for tooling. And let's just say our X position is zero. Since this is a center drill, I just want to move it out, change the tool, and then come right back in. The next operation is my drill. So it automatically defines the drill based on the tapping library, the thread library, which we'll take a look at here in a moment. Uh, then you have your cutting conditions. So this is something you really do want to take a look at. So I'm going to go back here for a second to this feature page. We had a 536 and 2 tenths depth, so 536. Our drill parameter, the effective depth is 679 because of the added amount for the, uh, the tip of that tap. These parameters are defined in your cutting conditions. We're going to open it up here after this so that you guys can see how to change all these values. So I believe it's a default of six threads that it's going to extend the drill depth. The overall depth is the included point angle, so it's important you guys put the, the correct point angle on your tool. This value does change, you know, if you're doing 135 drill instead. Now I'm at 727, where before I was... Oop, at 749. So it's going to make a, a, an impact on the depth that you go. But you want to double check this depth and compare it to the tapping depth as well. You always want to double check each one of these, especially on a blind tap. Now let's set this one to pecking. Now the peck is always going to be 50% of the tool diameter. So that's just the default. Again, you can change that in the current settings as well, or cutting conditions, I apologize. And we'll take a look at that after we calculate this one. Again, same thing here. I might want to just move it out a couple inches in Z and then no nothing in X so that it can switch to the tap and then come right back in. Now it's automatically pulling that tap in. 
one of the things that you're going to want to take a look at and you're going to want to understand your tap uh your taps and everything there's actually a really great uh haas tip of the day video out there on understanding taps and the different kinds and what they're used for and when you want to use them awesome video even if you don't have a haas it'll apply to you mill lathe it really doesn't matter he goes through a lot of great content but uh, this ineffective number of threads is going to be one of the biggest impacts of the next page. So that works just like the point angle would on a drill. So if I hit next real quick, you're going to see the effective and overall depth. So that, there's that 679. So it took that value and was using that for the effective depth here. So to the shoulder of the drill is where the tip of the tap is going. So that's the, the difference is you have the shoulder to the tip distance. We're going to give you all that on, the, uh, on this page so you can kind of check those values against each other. It's still probably a good idea to double check your code just to make sure that there's no discrepancies and all that. But this ineffective number of threads is going to affect how deep it goes totally because if you tell it it only has one ineffective thread, now it's going a lot shallower. So you want to make sure that you define your thread correctly. Usually spiral point taps, in my experience, have an average of four ineffective threads, but I'm sure there's variances to that depending on tool manufacturers. Uh, I haven't looked at all of them. So, And typically the speed, speeds and feeds should be all right for, uh, for tapping because we're just using the pitch, which is the way it should be for the can cycle. And again, you want to double check your overall ineffective depths to make sure they're all checked out with the drill depths, which in this case they look like they are. And then the last page is my rapid. So I may want this to go to default rapid at home, but maybe bring X or Z in a little bit, let's say three, and bring X to five. So now I've got my tap on the face of this. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of these settings. All right, so we've got our settings here. Now, you know what? I could be thinking totally wrong here. I don't use the SolidWorks plugin as often as I use the uh, standard, but yeah, cutting conditions, that's something we have in our standard one. The, the, the tapping library and everything is actually coming from SolidWorks, if I'm not mistaken. We're using their feature recognition, so we actually don't have any of that like built in. Um, the settings that you're going to have in Bobcam, though, are going to be your uh, system settings. Really, you don't need to change these at all. You have your document defaults and current document. Essentially, they're the same thing, just one applies to everything, one applies to just the file you have open. But you can set your um, default machining order in here. So that's actually a pretty important one. Now there is the knowledge base. So if you're doing um, milling at all, this is for the uh, feature recognition for the drilling. You don't have that option in lathe though. There is no, uh, oh, what do they call it? I can't remember the term that they use for it. So there's really not a lot of options up here that you're going to need to enter into Bobcat. Um, yeah, there are your current settings. Let's double check some stuff here real quick. Cutting conditions. There they are. So on the turning job itself, and even cam defaults, you can go in and set these cutting conditions. So this is going to be your rapid hole clearance, you know, where it rapids to for the, the hole clearance, the default number of pecs for center drill, um, the links added for a through cut, the pec increment, that's 50% of the tool diameter by default. Uh, the, there should be a pre-drill extension for blind taps which it actually is set to zero. So it's actually reading the overall depth of the tap and adjusting the drill to drill to that as the shoulder's depth. Any additional value would be added here. And again, you do want to double check your depths when you're doing the taps. 
just to make sure you're not uh, not messing anything up there. All right, so let's do some OD work here. So I'm going to go ahead and right-click Machine Setup 1, and we're going to go to Lathe Turning. Select Geometry. Now, you're going to see it, it looks a little different here. We're actually throwing a plane across the screen, so we can get a cross-section of the surfaces you select and the geometry that you're generating. Now, you can pick off the sketch if you need to, um, but it becomes a little more difficult because it's all one sketch. You know, you wouldn't really want to select that. So the couple of different ways to select stuff, and all of this is in the help system, by the way, so if any of you guys do need to get kind of a refresher on the different options we have for selecting stuff, you can just physically go in and pick surfaces. And, you know, define exactly what you're wanting to cut. You can turn on select whole bodies and automatically generate a profile off of that. If you have a more complicated model that you might need the mill as well as turn, maybe you don't have mill turn, you have a spun profile option, which you just pick the geometry and it spins it in the background so that all the you know, slots, cutouts, hexes, all that good stuff, it records the high point and generates a profile. You can also, if you're set to section planes, you can do multiple section angles. So I can set an interval of you know, 15 degrees and it's going to take a cross section of every 15 degrees and give me a profile, record the high points of that. You know, obviously that's a little extreme, you'd probably have something more like 45. But depending on, um, depending on your geometry, you have a lot of flexibility here on how it generates that profile. So what we're going to do is just do the, let's make one interval angle, and we're going to do select solid bodies, or select whole bodies, and then hit OK. And next. So now we have a couple more options on our feature page. So we still have our rapid plane, 200 thousandths from the previous, or for the, the, the geometry. You have your feature type, we're going to be doing OD, but now we have the option of OD, ID, front face, or back face. And then you got your direction of cut, region 1 or region 2. Now this one's really important here for grooves. I want to turn on remove primary undercut. And what that's going to do is cover over any grooves that I have along that OD. Secondary undercut would remove grooves along any faces. I don't have any along any faces, so I don't need to turn that one on. Then I have my constraints. I typically go from my stock. And then I have my extensions. So if I need to extend the end to say give me room for my uh, cutoff tool, I can just add that extension in. It's always going to be a positive number unless you're putting, making it stop that toolpath short. Then we have our strategies. We have our rough, rough and finish. And then you do have the pattern repeat and pattern repeat finish. So if you're doing like a casting, we're just going to leave it on the rough and finish here. We're going to go to can cycles. And actually, you know what, for this one, I'm going to do separate moves just so we can take a look at some of the additional options that we kind of skimmed over on the facing. Now I'm going to leave that same first tool in here. I'm not going to change the tooling, uh, really no reason to. My insert uh, orientation's right, my tool folder looks fine. We'll just hit next. Then we've got our patterns. Now we have a little more options. So you have a standard or an offset pattern. Offset essentially is just like pattern repeat, but it trims to your stock area. So you can't do it as a can cycle because it does trim to your stock. And you can do both of these either as a standard tool path where it's all cutting one direction, or you can do it as a zigzag. Very similar to uh, 
the adaptive on uh, Esprit's turning, kind of similar to that. So if any of you guys are familiar with that, that's kind of what it's like. The only thing is, is that when you do offset and zigzag, or just zigzag in general, you can't differentiate the feed for X and Z. You'd have to manually do that in the code. You still have your system comp off, on with, or without collision detection. Now, I don't think this has any chance to collide with anything, but I'm going to do on with collision detection. Now we have our parameters. So let's say that cut depth will go 30 thou. Finish allowance, I'll just leave it 10 thou. I'm gonna leave the overlap to previous cut. There's not really any tapered walls, but uh, it'll still uh, kind of recut some of the areas. And then a couple of the other options that you get added here. You have chip break, which chip break, you have either a length of cut and then it'll retract whatever retract distance you give it. You can set a time, so however long you want it to, to run before it retracts, or you can set a length of chip. So let's set length of cut, and let's say I want to go 3 eighths before it retracts 50 thousandths. This other option here, bounds, will actually read back through previous operations and only kind of cut where the previous operation couldn't. So where that's handy is more or less like when you're doing a drill and then you have to go in and turn the ID of the part. Trim to stock works great in those cases and hopefully we'll be able to touch on that a little bit later today. Then I have my rapids. I'm just going to tell it to go to cycle start X and then Z. So it lifts up, moves over, and then starts right back into the finish. Uh, then we got our lead in and lead out. Parallel in should be fine. However, because it starts on a radius here, I'm going to actually tell it to go horizontal. Sometimes if you do parallel, um, you'll get non-monotonous errors on the machine. Uh, there's, there's a few machines that have issues with that. So I'd like to try to do straight line moves going in, perpendicular to the cut or parallel to the cut, depending on what it is. And the lead out, let's just have that go at an angle. That way it's not rubbing the tool as it goes up the wall. Then we have our advanced feed rates, which we don't need. And then our finish tool. So let's say this is a V and MG. We'll go a little, little narrower. And I'm going to leave it at the 15 down nose radius. Uh, and then you also have your IC diameter, so that's the inscribed circle. If you're not sure what that is, you can talk to your, your tooling guys. That's pretty much essentially the, the size of the insert. And we'll change from my label here to VNMG. So now I have the option for a continuous path for a finish, or I can do an alternating path for a finish. So alternating is kind of nice because you can actually kind of reduce the load on the spindle as it changes directions. So you can have it cut all the diameters and then go back and do all the faces so that it's kind of keeping it consistent. Uh, direction for each. I don't see a lot of people using that very often. You can exclude angle walls, you can turn diameters only, or just faces, or both. Uh, but really continuous is 99% of the time all I've ever seen. And I'm going to do without collision detection for the comp, and we'll hit next. I'm not going to worry about chip breaking on this one. Uh, we're going to just kind of continue through. We'll do a round corner type, no finish allowance. Default rapid on exit should be fine. Let's actually just have this go to, yeah, let's do uh, default exit, rapid on exit, but we'll say one inch in Z and maybe two in X. Lead in and lead out. Let's just do a horizontal in and angle out, just like we did on the last. And then the last page is our advanced feed rates, which I'm not too worried about. So we'll hit compute. Now you'll notice that every three-eighths of an inch along this cut, it's retracting. So we're going to open simulation, take a look at that, and uh, before we continue, just so you guys can see how that chip rate works. Now to get to simulation, a couple different ways. You have simulation up top. You have simulation in your quick access toolbar. And then if I right-click turning job, you have simulation about halfway down.
So I'm actually going to slow this down a little bit. Uh, if you haven't run turning in simulation before, you're going to want to do length mode to kind of smooth out the movements. Uh, and then probably still slow it down quite a bit. It runs really fast. Let's set current operation, segment, okay. Typically it's going to fly through everything. So this is kind of a smoother simulation, so I can really kind of see what's going on. Some of the benefits in the simulation, some of the things you can do to kind of take a look at what's going on, is if I turn off the workpiece, which is just the solid model we're, we're cutting, and I make my stock transparent, I can even see how it's cutting going along, so I can see where those retracts are coming up at. If I have the workpiece showing, I'm going to see the difference between what I've cut and the model. Let's speed it up a little bit. Yeah, I usually use the stock transparency for when I'm doing ID cutting, so I can really get, get in there and see what's going on. Now, it did look like there was one section where it might have crashed. So if I go to my report page, there's a little collision here. Now, to me, that does not look like a collision. That looks like regular cutting. So what it was doing was going up the wall. Yeah, see, these movements here, a lot of times, because it's cutting on the other side of the insert, it doesn't think that it's actually able to, so it'll record it as a collision. So if you see those, you can always double check by clicking on the collision itself. And I can very clearly see those are not collisions. That's actually what I want it to do. It's cutting properly. So I'm gonna go ahead and close simulation. And we'll do this groove. So I'll go to Machine Setup 1, then Lathe Groove. Select Geometry. Now, if I want to include these fillets, or chamfers, sorry, I need to make sure I don't use can cycles. I'm going to repeat that because it comes up every now and then. If you're doing chamfers or fillets at the top of your groove like this, you have to use separate moves. Otherwise, it will not cut properly. So I don't really need to select anything else. It's just taking the section view of the uh, that section right there. So I'll hit OK. And next. So it's an OD groove. Uh, region 1 is fine. You do have a rotate option. So if you have an angled groove, you can actually rotate your cutter if you don't have a uh, holder that already gets that angle for you. And now the constraints, I don't want to go from stock anymore because then that's going to do a lot of cutting that we've already removed. So we want to go from geometry in this case. So what this does is it takes a bounding box around what you've selected and only focuses in that area. And I don't need extensions either, so I can just hit next. So we'll say a groove rough and finish. We're going to do separate moves because we have those fillets in there, or chamfers. And it's already pulled my number three tool, the one that's already on my turret. And I know that because if I do show tool holder, it's my narrow holder. That's one of the ways you can tell if you've got the right tool or not, is just show your tool holder, and you'll be able to determine if it's the one that you've defined or not. So I'll go ahead and hit next. Actually, let's make that an eighth thou radius. Now I'm getting a message because I've changed a portion of a tool that's already defined. I'm not sure I understand your question, Tom. What do you mean from geometry? Are you talking about the constraints? Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, it, you can type in the clarification for me. Yeah, so no, it's not reading the previous operation. I, I can go back and explain that here in a second. 
So I'm getting this message because I changed my radius from 15 thou to uh, 8 thou. So it says the tool parameters have been changed. Do you want to keep the changes for all operations in this feature that use the same tool? And I want to hit yes so that I don't have to worry about having to change it on the next tool. Now, what I think you're referring to, Tom, are you referring to this constraints here? Okay, so none of this reads previous operations. So I want to be clear on that. These constraints are not looking at any operations that you've already done. So if you define this improperly, yes, you're going to run into the scenario that you were describing there where you're going to hit material that you haven't cut yet. There is another area that we'll talk about later when we get to some ID work that you can have it read the previous operations. This is not it. This is just telling it how I want to constrain around the geometry. So I theoretically could still have all this material here and tell it to only cut this. It's just a way to constrain everything where it needs to be. Uh, so you do want to be really careful about the way you set your top, uh, top of feature. Now, there's a lot that factors into this, and I'm, I'm glad that you're asking these questions because you know, sometimes we don't get the question and nobody ever hears about it. So there's actually three things that kind of factor into the toolpath. The first one is the stock, the stock you've defined. If you don't define stock somewhere, it's not going to cut it. So, for instance, like earlier when I was mentioning, if you don't add the material to the face of the stock, it's not going to give you a facing operation. That's why we have custom. So you can define additional. So if you accidentally leave the stock, say, right flush to the face of the part and the OD, the exact OD of the part, you can add a custom distance to tell it to, to go more beyond that. Um, if you do from stock, it's looking just at the stock that you've defined. Now you can see that here. So even though this might be what you've selected, it's taking this bounding box area because it needs to define it based on the stock model. And then from geometry is just looking at the area of what you've selected. From geometry, I use pretty much exclusively on grooves. That's kind of the way to, that I usually kind of go about it. All right, so then we have our patterns for grooving. Now, I am in can, uh, not in can cycles, so I get all the options available to me. If I'm in can cycles, I don't get all of this. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you go into a, a groove that you're in a can cycle, you might not see all these options available. So you have a standard pattern. You have a single pass. So if you have like a form tool that you're doing, just a single cut. Uh, and then you also have a zigzag pattern. Now, if I'm using standard, I can set my sorting. So I could tell it to just cut one after the other. Now, this one is dependent on this region. So if I'm using region two, one is on the opposite side. So just be aware when you're looking at these numbers here, depending on what you've told it previously, may change the relative position of what start and end would be. Uh, center out starts in the middle and goes one direction and then back the other. Center out alternating is back and forth. And then skip is skipping every other cut and then coming back the other way, which ironically enough, I'd say about two months before, maybe a month before, we released version, I think it was 29, where we added all that. I had had the first person ever asked to do this, and it, I'd never heard about it since. I keep wanting to remember who that customer was so I can call them and let them know. It's been years now. Now, there is no collision checking. There, it has to use the full width of that cutter because it's a groove. But you do get the option of using the tool holder. So if you have a tool holder that has a, a more shape to it than this, you may need to turn that on so that it, it can avoid collisions. Then my parameters look very much like the regular turning parameters. I have my step over, uh, my rough allowance, which the rough allowance gives you some options for how it finishes, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then you have your finish allowance, just like with regular turning. So I'm going to leave 10 and 10. Then you have two majorly different options here. You have multiple depths or pecking. You can use both technically, but multiple depths, 
you set a depth of cut, how it processes it by area or by level. So you can see here by level, it's or by area, it's just this kind of cutting across, doing 100,000 pecs all the way across, and the next depth, the next depth, the next depth, and then switches regions. Zigzag will do those multiple depths kind of going down. Same thing by area or by level. Pecking, you're specifying the first peck amount, the peck increment, and then the peck clearance. So if you need to get through some, you know, uh, mill scale, you can extend your first peck, you know, set a peck increment, and then your clearance coming out. This trim to stock is what you were thinking of, Tom. This is the one that will look at the previous operations and only cut what's remaining. Uh, and I usually use that exclusively for ID work, uh, mostly if I have to drill or bore out a, a hole first and then do some work, that comes in handy. And then we have our approach uh, and exit. So let's just go ahead and say we're going to go to cycle start, X, and then Z after this one. No reason not to. We're going to use the same tool after all. Now I can't change my lead in and lead out. It's only parallel in, parallel out. Advanced feed rates. I don't need to change anything here. And then I have my groove finish. Now I'm not going to change anything on the groove finish. I've already defined the tool. So we'll hit next. Now we have our pattern for how it finishes. So the default and what we've always used, so if anybody's familiar with previous versions of Bobcat, um, we've always done the force down cutting. So that's going to cut them from either side to the center. Now that center is based off of this theoretical point. So as it comes in from, say, the right side and comes to the middle on that theoretical point and then comes out, goes from the left to that theoretical point, that theoretical point lines up the same spot every time. So you're essentially getting 100% of that tool overlapping on a force down cut. Additionally, you can add an extra overlap. But that's an extra overlap. It's, it's already overlapping technically the entire width of the tool. Then you have basic finish, which is just coming in one side and then out the other. Uh, typically, not very common. And then you have your system comp on with collision detection or off. This essentially is doing a turning operation with a grooving tool. I want no finish allowance. I don't need my corner types. And I don't need to trim the stock because I'm not really setting it beyond anything that I can't do with my constraints. I have my rapids again. So maybe I want to go to Z, I don't know, 2 and X3 just to throw some numbers out there. And then my lead in and lead out, I do get some options, but the defaults are usually going to work for the operation you're doing. Again, we kind of set all that stuff ahead of time for you based on some of the selections in the beginning. And then your advanced speed rates at the end, we'll just hit compute. So it looks pretty good there. Let's go ahead and check simulation before we do a cutoff. Now, I've already seen a lot of this uh, already play out in simulation. I've already seen everything run except for the, the groove, essentially. So what I want to do is come over to my move list, and I'm just going to go to groove rough. So that loads everything up to that point where I can then just go through and watch the groove. So this is a standard step over, just stepping over 50 thou per cut. Now it's going to do the finish, so it comes in from one side to the middle, and then comes from the other side back to that same spot. And you can see that really overlaps the entire tool. So the overlap amount on the force down cutting is an additional value. So that looks pretty good. Maybe let's make our stock shown and work piece hidden so we can see what it actually looks like here. And just a little side note for any of you guys that do any 3D printing, you can actually go into your cut sim tab down at the bottom right and save your stock simulation file. It just saves as an STL and then you'd be able to print it. Uh, I run into that a lot with mill work where people want to prototype something. 
using the actual CAD model gives you a different result than the one that would be coming off the machine. So this allows you to go in and simulate the toolpath and then try physically using that exact part. Now it's not as great on turning because uh, turning can have some variation to simulation, but it, it's really great on mill. So if any of you guys do any mill work and 3D printing, you can save your stock out. Now, last but not least, we'll do our cutoff, and then we'll probably open things up for q and I don't know if uh, I was using Rhino all day last yesterday, so I keep using the wrong button to rotate. Um, I don't know. It, it looks like Tom's been the only one asking any questions, but we're going to open up for Q&A here in a couple minutes. We're just going to throw on a cutoff tool. And actually, let's do a thread as well. We've already tapped the inside, but let's throw a thread on the outside too. So let's let's do lathe thread. We'll just put as much as we can on this thing. So I'll select geometry, and I'll just pick that uh, that ring right there. Not something you typically probably have uh, threaded, but now there's not a lot going on when you do a mill th or lathe thread. Uh, you'll have your rapid plane like all the others, your feature type, OD, ID, front face, or back feet, and face, your region, essentially that's setting the direction of cut, and then you have some extensions. Now, one of the things that I like to do with the extensions, it's actually kind of an interesting one, is you can set an end extension that's a negative number. So if I know that I have, let's say, about 30 thou from the tip of my um, threading tool to the actual like wall of the thread or the face of that tool. I can go in here and say I want to do a negative, let's say 35, let's do 40 thou distance. So what that's going to do is take that geometry I selected and cut it short 40 thousandths. So the tool's not going to go the entire length of it. Just something I found out one day kind of accidentally. Now we'll do can cycles. Typically threading I want to use can cycles. Uh, you do have the lay down or top notch uh, type of style tool. I'm just going to stick to the lay down. Uh, actually, we'll just pick top notch there, just so you can see the difference. You still have the t show tool holder. Uh, if I go back to lay down, it's going to look a little funny. So let me go to tool crib, add from tool library, and I'm just going to grab the 60 degree lay down tool. Then hit OK again. And that just essentially brings it back to the original default one. So it's got a 3,000 nose radius, uh, half inch IC diameter, and the tip height is an eighth of an inch. So let's actually change that tip height because that 40 thousandths is not going to be enough. Let's change that to um, sixty-two and a half. Now the next page, you're actually defining what the thread is. So to be clear, when you're doing threads per unit, it de it's dependent on what type of unit you're in. So because I'm in inches, if I do 20 and I have a diameter of quarter, it's making a quarter 20 thread. You know, if I say 15, you can start seeing the thread pitch change, the thread height change. So you're really going to want to know what kind of thread you're getting here. Big thing that I always try to point out about threading. One, the override here. So if your thread height's not correct for the thread you're trying to achieve, you may need to turn that on to get the right thread height. That should work out for us for this. Uh, and then you have your first cut amount and last cut amount. Depending on your machine, depending on your can cycle, is going to change what those values actually mean. Uh, so what I mean by that is that sometimes first cut amount is the only thing you see in your code. Sometimes it's not first cut or last cut. It's actually minim minimum cut and maximum cut. So you really got to understand your can cycle and how these values are relative to it. So we're going to kind of come back to these a little bit after we look at the code. Then you have your thread in feed angle. Typically, if you're doing a 60 degree, 60 degree thread, you do a 60 degree in, in feed. And then the can cycle chamfer out, I personally have not seen um, 
any can cycles this, this necessarily does anything with, but that could be just we don't have it defined properly for whatever machine. Nobody's ever, I've honestly never had a question on it, so it's something that's never come up. Um, so if any of you guys actually use that, you can always let me know and we can get that stuff in your post. This has the same default rapid on approach and exit, so I'm just going to leave that alone. And then you have your lead in and lead out. Lead in, we'll just make that a little less, maybe 125. Lead out, I just want it to stop and come right off. So I'll compute. Now, if I back plot this, so one thing that a lot of people don't know about is that in, there we go, that'll, that'll kind of work. In our uh, workspace, we can bring our tool by right-clicking the lathe thread or any tool and going to back plot. It's going to allow us to bring that tool into the workspace where we can see what it's going to do. Now, this is not actually what a threading tool is going to do on a machine. Uh, however, you can see where it's stopping short. That's really mostly what I wanted to show you there. So it's stopping short that 40 thou before coming off the part. Threading is the thing that I mean that is not going to be the same in simulation as it is on your machine. For those of you that don't know what it looks like, I'll show you right now. Let's actually just skip ahead, lay a thread. So in simulation, to just simulate a thread, that tool is just going to move up and down. Um, in reality, that's not the case. So just be aware, uh, know how to read your can cycle, because that's really going to be determined you know, more so how it's going to act. Uh, when you're simulating, it's not actually spinning the stock. It's just sitting there stationary. Um, so there's no way to actually generate a thread. Now about the code, let's go ahead and take a look at that can cycle real quick while it's fresh in our mind. But if we go to turning job, let's close simulation. I'll go to post. So scroll down to the bottom. Then we got our lathe thread here. Now I'm zooming in by holding control and using the mouse wheel to zoom in and out there. So I can see it's a G76 cycle. And the way that this one works is it's not using that 3 thou value. So it's giving me my X diameter, my Z total depth. The I is for a taper. K is the thread height, I believe. Uh, then you have your depth as the D and your in feed as the angle. So this one actually doesn't use that minimum depth of cut or the last depth of cut. So really knowing your can cycle is going to really benefit you when you're doing threading because you'll know if it's right or wrong kind of at first glance. Um, and for those of you that need any additional assistance with that, like if you get all the information for your can cycles, you're not sure how that's being applied, you can contact us. We'll help you through, show you how each number is you know, being used. But last but not least, let's go ahead and do a, a cutoff, and then we will break for Q&A. So I'm going to go back to machine setup, then I'm going to go to lathe cutoff. Now when you do a cutoff, you're really just picking where you're cutting off to, which I don't have a point or anything. I guess I probably should have. Yep, I'm going to need a point. So let's actually just create a sketch real fast. Then we'll just do a line. Exit my sketch. And we'll go ahead and do the lathe cutoff. You really just need a point to tell us where you're cutting off at. Uh, we're going to be finding the position based off of this relative machine coordinate position to get to that location. So as long as you have a point there, point, a line, something you can snap off of, uh, you'll be able to select that. So you have two options here. Now, this one's kind of a unique one. Um, you either have from stock or custom. So from stock, 
if we've turned down an area, which we've already done, it's going to be putting a chamfer, if we add a chamfer or fill it, way up in space where there's no material. So we would actually need to do custom and pick the diameter we're going to. So I'm going to pick that point right there. That should set, oh, it set it as a negative. Let's, that's odd. That's the correct side. Let's pick the ring. Okay, so that gave me a better value. We'll see if that, you know, lines up. It should. Because I want to say that's a radial value from the center to the diameter to that radius side. Uh, so we're doing just a cutoff operation. We'll do can cycles. Now I'm going to go in and grab my grooving tool, the one I defined earlier. So I'm going to click Tool Crib and grab the number three tool. And we'll hit Next. So I can see cutoff in Z, that's negative three inches. That's the distance from the face of the part back. Cut off an X, I know I have an 8 thou radius on my tool, so I actually want to put that as like maybe negative 10 to get it beyond zero. And then the retract amount, I'll just leave it at zero. Now corner breaking, you can either do a chamfer or a fillet. Now uh, let's just do it as a chamfer. Actually, fillet would probably look better on this part. And I'll make it something small, like 25 thou. You also do have pecking as an option if you need it, but I'm just going to let it do single depth. And then last but not least, you have your retracts. You'll want to make sure you set the correct home, maybe three and three there. And then I'll hit compute. So I can see that radius is being applied way out here, but if we do a back plot, it's going to plunge to the depth of that radius first, retract, move over, and then sweep the arc, and then cut off the part. And I should be able to zoom in and see that it's going a little bit past the center of the tool, or the, uh, the center of the part, which actually I could probably extend it out a little bit more, maybe 15 thou or so negative. And to get my code so that I can send it to my machine, I just want to right-click Turning Job and go to Post. Now the default machining order, just so you guys know, is going to be... Um, individual feature. So what it's doing is it looks at the way that I added these toolpaths and it applies them in that order. If I switch to individual tool per machine setup, if I'm using tool one on a bunch of operations, it's going to try to do all the operations with that tool one first. So if I don't have my tools labeled correctly, they're not going to give me the, the correct order. Uh, so you definitely want to double check tool numbers at this point. So the machining order is one thing. The next is verify tool assignment. You want to make sure that your tools are actually correctly labeled. If they're not, you uncheck use automatic tool numbering and then go in and define what they are. Pretty straightforward. You just double click on it. You know, maybe the groover is 12. Uh, my threader maybe 10. My grooving tool might be number three. Uh, my finish tool might be two. My rougher might be number one. And then my drills could be, you know, like 11 and... Oh yeah, I got a rolling tap in there too. But now those are set as the tool numbers for this job. So you can either go ahead and add them to a tool crib in the order that they're on your turret so that when you select it, it's in the correct location. Or when you're done programming a part, because tool numbers can change on you if it automatically generates one, you just go in and enter in the value for the tool number and hit OK. That way when you post out your tools or post out your code, all your tooling should be correct. Now, like I said, we're going to open up for Q&A, so if any of you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, I'm actually going to step away for just a few minutes, go use the restroom, I'll be right back, and uh, we'll touch on any questions when I return.
All right, I am back. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Uh, we're going to be hanging out here for another uh, uh, 25 minutes or so before we take a break for lunch. So uh, if anybody has any questions, let me know. If not, shortly we'll probably break for lunch and then we'll be back at one, but uh, we'll just see if anybody has any questions. Uh, yes, so Tom asked, can you custom design tool holders? Yes, you can. Uh, and that was actually one of the things that we're going to touch on this afternoon. Um, but it is also in your help system. So actually have that kind of open here. Hold on. I know you guys can't see my this other screen here. Hold on one second for me. Let me find it. Oh, yeah, tools. So um, get back to a normal size here. So you do have a custom tools section. You have tool holders and tool inserts for lathes that you can custom do. So if I go to tool holders, we actually have a tutorial already set up. You do have to be uh, pretty particular about where you design the holder itself. It's got to be in a correct location. Uh, I can't remember if you have to have a coordinate system or not, but you have to have specific geometry types uh, for things to be defined properly. Uh, this little tutorial just takes you through that. Uh, you have to have the little sketch defining X and Y. Um, same thing for the inserts, same deal. You have to have very specific, you know, uh, construction lines for the X and Y axis, you have to have the theoretical tip on that. Uh, your mounting position, how it attaches to the holder, needs to be as a construction line. Yeah, and you can see the theoretical tip that it's generating off the tangencies of that. Uh, so yeah, you can define your own custom holders, inserts, everything you need. Like I said, we'll go over that this afternoon. Otherwise, I won't have any content for later. All right, so it doesn't look like there's any other questions right now. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. Uh, we will be back at 1 Eastern, and we will pick up from then. I will talk to you guys then.